Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. <coughs> Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. After a weekend of frenetic diplomacy, with Secretary of State Lincoln visiting at least six Arab capitals and King Abdullah of Jordan touring Europe, we asked on the 10th day of the Israel-Hamas conflict, what does the future look like for Israel and what does the future look like for the wider Middle East? Joining me to help answer that critical question is India's former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman and the United Arab Emirates and one of our country's foremost experts on the Middle East, Talmiz Ahmed. Talmiz Ahmed, in a statement the Israel army has put out, it said it will attack Gaza by land, air and sea. And although it hasn't said when this will happen, it's pretty likely it's going to be soon. What will be the impact on the people of northern Gaza and Gaza City, which are the likely targets? Of the 1.1 million, several hundred thousand have fed south, but several hundred thousand remain. What will be their likely fate? Israel's political and military leadership are today being propelled by vengeance, deep-seated anger and vengeance the desire to wreak the maximum possible harm and damage on the hapless people of Gaza. It is not going to be as easy as they think. There will be a heavy price to pay on the side of the Israelis. In 2014, when they attacked Gaza and they went in only for a short uh, you know, distance, they killed 2,000 Palestinians. But at that time as well, they had, uh, they had lost 66 Israeli soldiers. This time is much more vehement. There is a global outcry against the extraordinary harm that has already been inflicted upon the people of Gaza. But have you noticed there is no strategic advantage that Israel has reaped so far? They have no. They have not been able to. Uh, they have not been able to release any hostages. They have not been able to kill any prominent Hamas people. What they have done is to kill several hundred Palestinians, including, I am told, 500 children. Now, this is just vengeance and hatred rather than any strategic objective. There is no indication from the Israeli side. What are they seeking? They say we will demolish Hamas, but that's not going to happen. And we know that. But then are you anticipating that when they launch this attack by land, sea and air, that we will see thousands, possibly tens of thousands of civilian Palestinians in Gaza being killed or injured? Is that what you anticipate? I think that is the only result that will happen after this massive assault. I'm not sure that their, their other objective of killing a large number of, uh, of Hamas leaders will actually be realized. We don't know. The main thing is that there is an anger and there is a frenzy and this is reflected in many of the remarks that are coming from Israeli leaders. In fact, sometimes I wonder, are they entirely balanced? Are they actually sensible and sane? Look at the remarks being made by the We will come to the remarks being made in a moment's time. Let's first focus on Gaza. 
side by side with thousands of tens of thousands of civilian Palestinians in Gaza being killed and injured. You are also from your first answer suggesting there could be a very high Israeli soldier death toll or injury toll. Absolutely. There is already a lot of writing by very distinguished people suggesting that there will be a very heavy price to pay. You know, urban fighting has always been disastrous for the one who attacks. Uh, the people whom you attack are familiar with the nooks and crannies of that place. Uh, and you don't know as well as they do. Plus, you have Hamas that has built a lot of tunnels all across uh, this territory. And they are familiar with those tunnels. So, you, uh, there would be a price to pay. That my sense is, as of now, I have seen that the mobilization uh, for the land attack has been in place for at least two or three days. And yet they have not initiated the assault. Is there any diplomatic activity taking place behind the scenes? I'm not we'll sure. We'll come to that in a moment's time. We'll come to that in a moment's time. Let's go step by step first. Israel's target, and they've made this pretty clear, is Hamas and its infrastructure. And as you said a moment ago, much of that infrastructure is in underground tunnels. Some of those underground tunnels are said to be 50 meters deep. In some instances, it's said even bunker buster bombs, were Israel to use them, may not be able to penetrate as deep as the tunnels are. So my question is, can this Israeli air and ground strike succeed in obliterating Hamas, to use the language of the Israeli army? See, Hamas is a movement. It is a resistance movement. A resistance movement flourishes when it enjoys popular support. To the extent that it enjoys popular support, it cannot be obliterated. You can kill a few cadres, you can even kill a few leaders, but you cannot obliterate the movement. Only when popular, uh, only when popular support diminishes does the organization wither away. Most organizations have remained in place largely because Israel has not conceded anything on the two-state proposal. That is the, uh, that is the key. And until that happens, you will have resistance movements. After all, Hamas uh, came into being in 1987. It has been attacked by the Israelis at least four or five times. And several thousand Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. And yet the organization has not been dented nor has it lost popular appeal. Let me put it like this. Hamas would have undoubtedly planned for an Israeli invasion, incursion into Gaza. They would have protected themselves to the extent they can against it. Is there a danger that Israel might be lured into a trap? Some sort of trap that might actually catch Israeli soldiers and inflict a higher death toll than Israel is prepared for. Is there a danger to that? Or do you think the sophistication of the Israeli army will ensure that the relatively weaker Hamas cannot do this? I think there is a lot of propaganda about the Israeli army. Who has the Israeli army faced since 1973? They, all their firepower has been directed at militants, militants like Hezbollah, militants like Hamas uh, and, the, uh, and the various Palestinians in the West Bank. They have not fought an army up to now. And, but we have an image of the IDF as a robust force. They lost in one day 300 soldiers at the hands of Hamas. 300 soldiers have already been killed. It shows an army that is not the kind of army of our imagination it is a bunch of people who are overwhelmingly reservist and who have not actually experienced real battle conditions. My concern is that they could have a serious uh, fight back. They would have a serious fight back on their hands if they were to enter Gaza. I believe that it will not be. A, they will kill ordinary people. And that's what they are good at. And that's what they are doing even as I speak to you. Killing 500 children and 300 women is not the sign of prowess and it does not do any credit to a serious professional army. This but army has not faced, it has you're, not you're faced a serious... You are anticipating a serious fight back from the Hamas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's now come 
to some of the statements and comments that have been made by Israeli leaders. First, on Friday, Israel's <coughs> President Isaac Herzog refused to recognize any difference between civilians in Gaza and Hamas. He said, and I'm quoting him, and by the way, this was carried by Bloomberg, it is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not being aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up, they could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Do those comments from the President of Israel suggest that Israel is out not just to obliterate Hamas, but very possibly the entire Palestinian population of Gaza, because the president refuses to recognize any distinction between civilians and Hamas. The remarks of the president are an embarrassment to the people of Israel and to the international community. He is a figurehead president and there is expectation that he would be balanced and sensible that he would provide caution and wisdom at this time of serious crisis for his country. And yet, he has gone way beyond even Netanyahu, who is fighting for his political life. I am alarmed. I am alarmed at the absence of balance, absence of good sense on the part of this top leader of, uh, of Israel. He is supposed to be much more moderate and a source of caution and gravitas. And is he preaching genocide? Has he totally lost all good sense? I am alarmed. I am seriously concerned about the balance and sanity of some of these leaders. They are, they are whipping themselves up into a frenzy. Let me come now to Israeli politicians. You have Gallant. The Israeli defense minister has said Gaza will never go back to what it was. Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, has gone on record to say, we will change the Middle East forever. Now, is that simply angry rhetoric born of the heat of the moment? In which case, though it's regrettable, it might be understandable. Or do they actually mean that they will change the Middle East forever? Which of the two do you think it is? These two men whom you have quoted have shown themselves to be extremely incompetent. They are aware that they will face the ire of their citizens whom they have failed to protect. They are seeking to compensate for their incompetence and failure with this extraordinary rhetoric which has very little relation with reality. They are not showing themselves in a positive light whatsoever. They are showing themselves for what they are, pathetic little people desperately looking out for political survival in a very difficult period when they have failed their people and allowed 1400 to be killed in one day. So now I attach no significance. What do you mean change the Middle East forever? What are you talking about? What, is, what are you going to do? You were desperate for normalization with the Arabs just a few weeks ago. You want to be part of West Asia just uh, desperately want to be part of West Asia, desperately want to be accepted by the people uh, of that region. And now you say you will, you will obliterate this entire region. Do you have that capacity? Let us see. You can't. I am, I am appalled at this kind of, term, uh, of this verbiage, which does no credit to a serious country and its leadership. Against this background, Mr. Ebert, what are the dangers that the Israel-Hamas conflict could spread further into the region? The Iranian foreign minister, Hussein Amir Abdullahia, has said, and I'm quoting him, in light of the continued aggression, war crimes and siege of Gaza, opening other fronts is a real possibility. And then on Sunday, Axios says, Iran sent a message to the United Nations that it will intervene if Israel launches a ground offensive. The tweet put out by the Iranian representative of the United Nations didn't quite say the same thing, but certainly warned against intervention in Gaza by Israel. Secondly, the Hezbollah deputy chief, Niam Qasem, has said, we as Hezbollah are contributing to the confrontation and will continue to contribute to it. 
adding calls asking us not to interfere in the battle will not affect us how do you read these two statements one from iran the other from hezbollah do they suggest this conflict is poised to spread further what you are seeing just now is public rhetoric and brinkmanship and behind the scenes intense diplomacy i don't think anyone is seriously interested in spreading the conflict spreading the conflict means a massive assault upon lebanon the kind that the israelis carried out in 2006 and that has served no useful purpose since then hezbollah has become much stronger than it was before it is also far better equipped in terms of weaponry particularly drones and rockets we have read that they have got 150000 drones and rockets that they will shower upon uh, the israel they could shower upon the israelis similarly i don't believe the iranians are interested in a major conflict they have enough problems that they have to settle at home but more importantly overall from their perspective they are far better off in the region than they were a few months ago they have very substantial ties uh, with the saudis uh they have they are selling a lot of oil and revenue is coming in it is the americans that were desperately seeking some kind of agreement with them which is in place as of now and above all the iranians have built very substantial ties with china and russia they are a significant presence in west asia and central asia and in the caucasus i don't think they want to jeopardize any of this now my worry is something else my worry is that a completely desperate netanyahu may provoke a conflict recall here some things that used to be done during the trump administration a maniacal period in american presidential history where donald trump deliberately sought to provoke the uh, confrontation uh, with the iranians largely instigated by netanyahu and you recall uh, just uh, you will recall the deliberate and public assassination of the al quds chief qasem soleimani i am worried about that that there could be a deliberate provocation by netanyahu absent that i personally feel that the israelis will be much more cautious with regard to a massive ground assault in gaza and i don't think the iranians or the hezbollah want a broader conflict That's very clear. Let's then turn to Saudi Arabia, by far the more important and more powerful country in the Middle East. Let's look at the official statements coming from Riyadh. Initially, the Saudi Foreign Office spoke of the deprivation of the Palestinian people of their legitimate rights. A day later, Crown Prince Mohammed said Saudi Arabia stands by the Palestinian people to achieve their legitimate rights to a decent life. achieve their hopes and aspirations and achieve just and lasting peace the important thing is neither of those statements spoke of palestinian statehood but since then saudi arabia has categorically rejected the evacuation of gaza they did that in concert with the qatari foreign minister they summoned an urgent extraordinary meeting of the organization of islamic cooperation on wednesday in jeddah to address the escalating military situation and perhaps most importantly the washington post this morning says the crown prince kept secretary of state blinken waiting for hours before he met him according to the paper the meeting was scheduled for the evening it didn't happen till the next morning and when it did the crown prince forcefully said that the siege of gaza must be lifted so how do you read the clearly evolving saudi response they began mild and pretty calm but they're becoming tougher and more insistent about the way in which israel responds so how do you read this ev- evolution the saudi remarks have are in conformity with developments on the ground vis-a-vis the gaza war initially or they were obviously shocked by what had happened and they talked of palestinian aspirations when we speak of palestinian aspirations it is well understood we don't need to give an elaborate essay it is well understood it refers to a sovereign and viable state 
for the Palestinian people with East Jerusalem as their capital and the right of return of refugees. It is well understood. It is an integral part of uh, the scenario in the region. It was already identified during Oslo 1 and 2 and it is now an integral part of the scenario. So, when the, is when the Saudis talked of the aspirations of the Palestinians, they are already referring to these three points, which are an integral part of their aspirations. They have now, since then, they are focusing on the Gaza conflict. On the Gaza conflict, they are very clear. They want military, uh, they want military uh, in operations to be suspended immediately. They do not want further escalation. I think they are referring to Lebanon in this regard and Syrian the attack and they want humanitarian assistance. I want to emphasize this point that all Arab leaders are subject to the, uh, to the passionate support that their own people extend to the Palestinian people. So, regardless of the interests of leaders and sometimes leaders can be tempted to compromise on the Palestinian issue if it suits their interests. Uh, they cannot, over a longer period of time, pretend the Palestinian issue does not exist. I understand I that. Can I put this to you? What do you make of the fact, assuming it's true, that the Washington Post claims Crown Prince Mohammed kept Secretary of State Blinken waiting for us? In fact, not just us. The meeting, which was supposed to be in the evening, didn't happen until the next morning. What do you make of that? That is clearly deliberate and it is clearly intended as a slight slight. Well, it's difficult always to explain uh, the meanings of these things that happen in the Gulf. Uh, Gulf leaders are royal family members. They are senior members. Uh, they are uh, royal family members and royal family members can be occasionally capricious. Also do recall that while Blinken is from a prominent a major country like the United States, in terms of rank, he is subordinate to the crown prince. The crown prince is also the prime minister of his country. So, okay. there is an asymmetry in terms of their ranks. If Blinken was kept waiting, there is, these kind of things have happened in the past. They will happen again in the future. I would not read too much into this so-called diplomatic slide. I would read much more importantly into the message that the Saudis have conveyed to Secretary of State Blinken. Let me come to what the same Washington Post article reveals about Fatah al-Sisi, the president of Egypt. According to the Washington Post, when Blinken <coughs> met him, Sisi, first of all, commented adversely on the fact that Blinken had introduced himself in the company of Netanyahu in, in Jerusalem as a Jew. And Sisi said, I was born amongst Jews and we have no problem with Jews here. And clearly what Sisi was saying is we don't like your coming as an American Secretary of State and yet presenting yourself as a Jew, that suggests that you're taking sides. And more importantly, Sisi also said to him that already by the manner in which Israel is behaving in Gaza, it has gone beyond the boundaries of self-defense. Now that was an even harsher, harder message than the one from Saudi Arabia. And Egypt is the next door neighbor, not just of Israel, but more importantly of the Gaza Strip. How do you respond to what Stisi said? What has happened during the Blinken tour, first to Israel and then to Saudi Arabia and Egypt, indicates the complete absence of understanding the region on the part of the Americans. The Americans have engaged with West Asia for 50 or 60 years and yet I must emphasize to you they have no clue about what is happening there. What they think they look at everything in terms of their own interest and they completely fail to see, have any empathy with regard to their interlocutors and their interests which is why they have failed and which is why after the nightmare of the Trump presidency the region has consciously and deliberately moved away from the Americans. Okay. They no longer see the Americans as security guarantors. They, do no, they no longer look at an exclusive relationship with the Americans, an exclusive security relationship. 
I have emphasized this and I say it again, they are asserting strategic autonomy. Look at this, Blinken goes all the way to Israel and says, oh, I am originally Jewish and therefore I can understand your oppression. And we have to point out to him, since when were the Jews oppressed in West Asia? Certainly not by the Muslim community. The Muslim community protected them. It is the Christians who assaulted the Jews, indulged in pogroms, and finally uh, culminated with, uh, with this, hello, uh, with this uh, German Holocaust. Please recall, in the last 1400 years, Jews had sanctuary in Muslim kingdoms. Their Absolutely. And their culture uh, flourished. And, and, and let's, not, let's not get reflected into history, but that was precisely the point that CC was making. That Jews Absolutely have not correct. been discriminated in the Middle East, they were discriminated in Europe, which is the context in which CC brought up the fact that Absolutely. Lincoln had introduced himself in Jerusalem, in the company of Netanyahu, as a Jew. Let me ask you one more question about the region and specifically about Saudi Arabia before we talk about America. As I said, Saudi Arabia is by far the most important country in the Middle East. How will it respond if Israel were to launch this attack on Gaza by land, sea and air? Even if the leadership, the royal family and the crown prince himself wish to be restrained, will they be forced by their public opinion, by the Saudi street, to be much tougher in response? I don't believe there is much that the neighboring countries of Israel can do effectively in the region. I don't believe that. I believe whatever happens in regard to Gaza will be determined by the Prime Minister Netanyahu and by his military advisors. The only people who can have some modicum of influence in Tel Aviv are the Americans. The American role is very ambivalent because they are already in election mode. They are looking really bad. You have Biden uh, barely able to articulate three sentences effectively. And yet he plucked up the courage yesterday to say that while he supports the annihilation of the Hamas, he still wants a Palestinian state. That means he got he plucked up the courage to say that the United States supports a Palestinian state. Now, I am not able to figure out. After all, Hamas represents a resistance movement because Israel has refused to provide a state. So, make up your mind. Do you want Palestinian aspirations to be fulfilled? If, that, if so, make a sincere effort in that regard. But, but can, the, I interrupt, uh, can I interrupt? It's not just that he said yesterday in his interview to CBS 60 Minutes that he stands for a Palestinian state. Biden has also earlier, and in fact on two occasions, first he was addressing Jewish leaders in Washington, and he mentioned this again in his CBS interview yesterday. He said Israel must abide by and observe the rules of war. Are there here, if carefully delivered, two messages to Netanyahu? A, you need to start accommodating a second state in that area, a Palestinian state. And B, whatever you do must be in coherence with the rules of war. Are there messages being sent here? Whatever the Americans try to say, Netanyahu picks up what he wants to. He does what he has to. The Americans, to the best of my knowledge, over the last 30 years, from 1991, they have been driven by Israel and by Israeli interests, rather than imposing anything on the Israelis. The last time they were able to promote a peace process was in the context of Oslo 1 and Oslo 2, which was a direct initiative between the Palestinians and the Israelis and did not immediately involve the Americans. Americans at that time were having a dialogue in Washington, but the Oslo meetings were initiated between these two meetings, uh, between these two people. The assassination of Rabin ended that. Since then, there is no way that I have seen, no occasion that I have seen that the Americans have been influential in cautioning, moderating or slowing down this Israeli aggressiveness. 
On the okay. other hand, I have seen the opposite. I have seen the Israelis dictate terms to the Americans. You know, we have heard from Netanyahu. He persuaded Donald Trump to renege on the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement. He is the one who encouraged the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. He takes a lot of credit. So uh, you have seen a very asymmetrical engagement between Israel and uh, the United States, where you know the term "wag the dog" has been used very frequently in this regard. It is Israel that runs U.S. policy, not the other way around. Let me ask one more question about America's keen interest in the Middle East. At the moment, Washington is standing four square behind Israel. Nonetheless, Biden has warned Israel, as I said earlier, that it must abide by the rules of war. Now, Biden is also extremely keen that the deal that he was attempting to broker between Saudi and Israel should go ahead. I know the Saudis over the weekend have said it's on hold. No official said it, but unnamed officials have spoken to several newspapers and the message nonetheless is crystal clear. So is that deal now permanently on pause until we know the outcome of the Israel-Hamas conflict? Or could American promises to Crown Prince Mohammed to go ahead with the sale of advanced weapons, to approve a civil nuclear program, and most importantly, to give Saudi Arabia an ironclad U.S. security guarantee, still ensure that that deal goes through. Maybe it will pause for six, seven months, but it will still happen. This is not a dead-in-the-water situation. Most Arab countries in West Asia, Israel and the United States, are short-term thinkers. All their actions have a tactical value. None of them has a long-term strategic value. Therefore, your question, will the Saudis change their mind and seek normalization at some time? Almost certainly. We can't rule that out. Because royal families tend to act capriciously. They also tend to take their own interests into account. But my sense is, as of now, Saudi Arabia is no UAE or Bahrain. Saudi Arabia has a substantial population. It was also the leader of the Arab world and the Islamic world. It is the guardian of Mecca and Medina. It is looked up to by the entire Muslim world for leadership. I don't believe they can impulsively review, uh, renew normalization discussions when you have the Palestinian issue very much on the front burner. They had thought that they could place the Palestinian issue on the back burner because everything looked peaceful. And Jake Sullivan said uh, absolutely just a few weeks ago that West Asia has never been so peaceful as it is now. This is an American misreading of the situation. I would never have made such a remark. I'm a student of the region. I don't have access to all the information that he has. But I would never have said that West Asia looks peaceful when so many issues agitating the region are still live. Let me now ask you about King Abdullah. He at the moment is touring several European capitals. Yesterday and today he's in London. He's met with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. How much weight does King Abdullah carry? And secondly, to what extent will he be able to convince Paris, Berlin, London that they must restrain Israel and that whatever action Israel takes must be within the laws of war? King Abdullah of Jordan is respected. Jordan is respected. It has been traditionally a pro-Western country. And the concern that is agitating him and which has led to this flurry of activity is the nightmare scenario for him that the solution of the Palestinian issue will be found in transporting the Palestinians to Jordan, which would put extraordinary pressure on his monarchy and possibly end it. This is for him the nightmare scenario. So whenever you have a massive escalation of conflict, this old, uh, the old idea that is very popular in Israel, Somehow they want to get rid of the people. They want to retain the land because it is the promised land. The land promised uh, to the Jewish people by God himself. And, but they can't keep on this sacred land an alien people. 
the Palestinians are deemed to be alien though they have lived there for the previous 2000 years. So the solution that many Israelis have found in their wisdom is to send these all, all of them into Jordan. This is his nightmare scenario. It is, that is the reason for his diplomatic activism. He is basically convincing uh, uh, Western leaders, uh, particularly in Europe, that look, don't allow any massive transfer of population. Please end this conflict as quickly as possible. Don't allow Gaza to become a, a smoking cauldron because that's going to harm this region for a long time to come. But the core concern that he has is one that Israelis from time to time revive and seek to push through. It's like they are saying to the Egyptians, uh, take the South Gazans into Sinai and of course the North Gazans can go uh, to Jordan or anywhere else. They will never come back. This is the only solution the Israelis have found for the Palestinian issue and their legitimate claims. Let's come at this point, Mr. Ahmed, to India. After the Prime Minister, on two consecutive occasions, tweeted India's full support and solidarity with Israel and simultaneously referred to the Hamas attack as terrorism, the MEA spokesperson, in answer to questions that were asked, said India advocates the resumption of direct negotiation to establish a sovereign, independent and viable state of Palestine, living within secure and recognized borders side by side at peace with Israel. The spokesman also said there is a universal obligation to observe international humanitarian law. Now that is a clear shift from the original pro-Israel position tweeted by Mr. Modi to one that is much more balanced and nuanced and even-handed. What do you think brought about this shift? You see, Mr. Modi's first remarks were spontaneous and emotional. They were also part of the ideological sources, wellsprings, to which he belongs. He belongs to the Hindu Tva ideological force, ideological movement. And this movement has had traditionally a very strong and deep relationship with Zionism. But on the other hand, they also have this strong impulse to demonize Muslims in general, globally, as terrorists. So that is why it suited both the points to reaffirm Prime Minister's views, to reaffirm his personal relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu, his party and his ideological movement support for Zionism, and at the same time simultaneously depict Hamas as a terrorist organization, which fits in with the larger ideological framework to which he belongs. He has since attempted the second statement after the conversation with Netanyahu. There was a degree of moderation condemning Hamas as a terrorist organization, saying that the people of India support you, uh, uh, conflating himself with the people at large, but at the same time calling, did not name Hamas uh, at that stage as a terrorist organization that condemned terrorism in general. The spokesman's view is a reiteration of the traditional view that the international community as a whole has. It is a mantra. It is like, you know, you press a button and the world starts spilling out. This was largely in response because a lot of commentators uh, started saying that India has shifted away from its support to the two-state solution. You remember Netanyahu in the General Assembly had shown two maps. And the second map, he had shown all the occupied territories as an integral part of Israel. Uh, you know, the West Bank and the Gaza and East Jerusalem. And had shown all the neighboring Arab countries as his friend. Now, this was the concern that through the first two remarks of the Prime Minister, uh, have we moved away, and certain articles you would have seen in our own media, uh, saying that India has moved away from the two-state solution. And I had said that it is not for India to move away from the two-state solution. It is a solution that is accepted by the international community, by the United Nations, by the USA, by the European Union, and by the Global South. I think it has been thought wise in South Bloc to correct any misapprehension that there might be in certain people's mind while reiterating that Hamas is a terrorist organization. 
Very quickly, the Indian Express on the 11th of October reported that some Arab diplomats, including at least one unnamed Arab ambassador, had expressed surprise as well as disappointment by Prime Minister Modi's pro-Israel tweets. Do you think that also had some influence in the way we reframed I'm our sure, position? Uh, I'm sure that the feedback we got back, uh, there was a feedback that finally reached the powers that be. And uh, uh, I think a, a quick corrective action was taken. And we have now reiterated our support for the two-state solution, which is the internationally accepted mantra as far as Palestine is concerned. If no, even, Palest even Israel formally has never rejected the two-state solution, never done anything about Oops, we've lost you at that point. Are you there? We've lost you. Out it. Indeed, it had a thousand people. So you have that. They don't, they give lip service to the two-state solution without doing anything about it. Very quickly, I'm interrupting. We are experiencing trouble with this connection. I've got two questions to put to you before I end. I'm going to ask you for short answers because we don't know how long this connection will last. Basically, I want to ask you before I end, how you evaluate the response from Beijing and Moscow. Initially, both capitals had little to say. I'll come to Moscow later, but Beijing has now said quite clearly that the Israel strikes on Gaza have gone beyond self-defense. Incidentally, that's also what the Egyptian president said to Blinken. Does this mean that if Israel were to launch the ground strike by land, sea and air that they have promised, China is going to come down very hard on them? I cannot tell you what will be China's immediate response to a Gaza assault. I think the diplomatic activity taking place just now uh, between Beijing, Washington, Moscow, and the Arab capitals in the region, is and, and Tehran, is to prevent such a massive assault. What will be the basis of the agreement? What will be the basis for the truce? We do not know. Because there would be certain conditions. As we know, and I have mentioned this many times, Nathan Yu is fighting for his political life. And the military leaders also are under tremendous pressure. So we don't know whether good sense will prevail and that Netanyahu is shown the door without inflicting several thousand more casualties on the Gazan just to save himself. There is diplomatic activity and I think the message has gone across to Washington that you have to halt this. My Thank answer you. to you on the longer term, I think China is going to be a major role player in the Palestine-Israel issue. I think that they are gearing themselves up for this. They have already announced they want to take, play a role in promoting engagement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I, I will also say to you, I'll push my luck with you, there is not going to be a solution which will be a two-state solution. It will be a one-state solution. The, you have young people now both on the side of the Palestinians and the Israelis. They have, they are, today they have lived in an Israel that has been constantly in conflict. They have, I think, large sections of them have moved on. They okay. want a normal life. And I'm looking at a one-state solution, possibly brokered by the Chinese, possibly working in tandem with the Russians. I don't see any American role because the American domestic politics will not allow this kind of a grand arrangement in the region. And this means that if this one-state solution, which is your belief is in the making. I have to add for the audience, no one else has spoken about it as yet. This is only your personal interpretation. But if it's going to be broken by the Chinese, then clearly the Chinese cannot go out of their way to alienate Israel by whatever they say. They need to keep both the Palestinians and the Israelis reasonably happy so that they can play the role of a broker. Let's finally come to Moscow because Moscow's response in the last 24, 36 hours seems to be different. President Putin, according to TASS, has said Israel has, and I'm quoting, a right to defend itself against what he called unprecedented brutality. But he also spoke of the creation of an independent Palestine state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Absolutely. I think How do you do where, that? Yeah, I, I think that is... Prime Minister, uh, I mean, President Netanyahu, uh, Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Putin have built a very strong personal relationship. At a time, do recall, till a few weeks ago, 
Biden wasn't talking to Netanyahu. He didn't allow him to come to the White House. Two and a half years. And Netanyahu was looking really pathetic in Tel Aviv. It is Putin who looked out for him. And it is Putin who hosted him in Moscow. And of course, they have built up this relationship from the period uh, when the Russians went into Syria and were able to ensure that the situation with regard to Hezbollah in Syria and the Iranians in Syria did not get out of hand vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Israeli interests were safeguarded. I think that you have found now Putin, Russia and China are affirming to us that the Americans are today the day before yesterday's people as far as this region is concerned. And if I have to look at the future, I'm going to be looking at China and Russia working seriously and sincerely for a peace process that will stabilize the region as a whole. Can, can I interrupt and point this out? You say Putin and China have affirmed to the world that America is day before yesterday's country. And yet the man who's doing all the touring through Arab capitals is Blinken. The Chinese are not anywhere in the scene except that they make statements at the most. No, 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 no. They are. And they are sending Russia. Although Mikhail Bagdanov, the Russian deputy foreign minister, as far as Blinken is concerned, I attach no value to Blinken sauntering through the region. The Americans have no capacity to listen. They have no capacity to understand. They are totally influenced by their political domestic politics by the domestic situation and they have no they have no elbow room no flexibility they totally support israel and totally hate iran and that is where they are with in this basis you cannot have a u.s sponsored peace process where he is going is basically to listen to these people and i think he has listened he has heard enough none of them has supported the americans each of them has taken a firm position in favor of the Palestinian interest and have told him that you have to change. What did he do? He goes to Israel and says, oh, by the way, I have got Jewish origin and that makes me sensitive to your uh, predicament. This is nonsense. This is not the way you do regional diplomacy. You okay. have to empathize with your interlocutor rather than do all this nonsense that you are doing at present. I attach no significance to his sauntering through the region. All right, Mr. Ahmed, on that note, which many will find controversial or perhaps disagree, but at least you voiced your own opinion clearly, forcefully, and unequivocally. I thank you for making time for us, and I thank you for this tour d'horizon of the situation facing Israel and the wider Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.